Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, I can't believe it, it's Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. Michael, who has been on several due diligence assignments for the last couple of weeks. I am glad you're in the podcast. Happy Thank- to be here. Thank you. <laughs> How's your how's your uh, transactions coming? I think things are going well. It's uh, it's been a good time to be in the business, that's for sure. So yeah, things no complaints from from me. That's good. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in the old capital world before we start going into the podcast. Well, again, we'll beat the uh, pound the table again for the upcoming old capital conference, the second annual one, September thirteenth at the AT and T Stadium, where the Dallas Cowboys play. We're gonna have the keynote speaker, which we've we've mentioned on here a few times, Roger Staubach. So he's going to come out and give the keynote speak. But more than that, we're going to have uh, several panels. We're expecting about 700 people or so to attend, a lot of good networking. So it's uh, the event of the year for Workforce Housing across the country, really. Yeah, it's a great event. In fact, one of the guys in the uh, podcast today, he was featured on stage last year. In fact, uh, let's let's kick it over, really, to kind of figure out uh, Jacob Anderson with ARA, who's in the podcast with us. Jacob, uh, you were up on stage. How did you feel the event went? Yes. Hello, guys, and uh, good morning. I went last year to the Old Capital event, and uh, I would say that we go to these events quite frequently. That event was actually very well put together. I think the speakers, we went all from various angles, from management, from the broker point of view and to also owners uh, so i think that the, to hear what the other parts of the business they're doing and how they view uh, the market was uh, very valuable for myself so would you recommend people to come down who are interested in investing into texas absolutely absolutely yeah we, we think it's probably one of the premier events go to the old capital real estate investing podcast and take a look at that to get your tickets so anything else, Michael? That's again, it's oldcapitalpodcast.com. To be specific, that's where you sign up for the event. So in the podcast today, we are uh, pleased to have a couple guys that we've known for a long period of time that are, I would say, experts in the field of selling multifamily real estate in the Texas DFW market. Uh, one of the guys that's sitting in, in here, too, is works the, the secondary or tertiary markets. So not only do you have uh, representation for properties in the Dallas Fort Worth market but also maybe 100 200 300 miles away from Dallas Fort Worth and we'll talk a little bit about that and what the benefits are of owning a property in the secondary tertiary markets so in the podcast today we have Jacob Anderson with ARA hello Jacob hello good morning and then we also have Richard Fur with ARA good morning and following uh, Richard in the, the secondary tertiary markets it is Bart Wickard hello, hello Bart hello so, uh, Jacob, uh, how are things going these days? Give us kind of a general overview, and I'm going to kick it over to Mike. Yeah, maybe just talk uh, first and foremost. You guys have been on the podcast before, but maybe kind of give a general overview. I'm not sure which one wants to do it of kind of who ARA New Mark is and kind of your positioning in the uh, the multifamily space. Sure. So, since we were on last year, things has definitely not slowed down. The DFW market, the North Texas market, has been very heavy on transactions and i would say that goes with class c class b and also class a we cover all facets of the industry so we work with the class c asset class b assets and also a's we have been fairly busy i think we sold for right up around 1.3 billion dollars of real estate last year and we're looking at probably go above that this year between 1.5 to 1.75 billion so rest assured we have stayed busy 
It was good. So, so Richard, you guys are a boutique uh, firm, or used to be a boutique firm. And you're exclusively focusing on multifamily. Maybe talk a little bit more about the actual platform for ARA Newmark. Yes. Yeah, so it's an international platform. Newmark is 15,000 employees across the world. The uh, ARA division within Newmark focuses uh, solely on multifamily throughout the the U.S. So we have offices from Boston to to San Diego and in. 25 locations in between and we'll we'll be in the top three of production throughout the country and in most of the individual offices and we focus on you know uh, all classes of assets a b c land we have a debt arm and an equity arm so it's it's a full service uh shop but ara only does multifamily. that's correct yeah solely solely multifamily. Oh, good. Well, so let's maybe, uh, Jacob, you talked about the transaction volume is going to be a little higher in 2018 is kind of what it, what it looks like versus 2017. Maybe this kind of have a general state of the market. So from from your perspective, from a, a shop that's going to do, you know, $1.5 to $1.8 billion in volume, what's going on in the marketplace? How's 2018? We're about halfway through the year now as we record this in 2018. So how, how's the year been to date? How's that kind of been versus what you guys thought it would be going in and how it was kind of last year? What's going on out there today? Well, when you kind of set your year in the beginning around Christmas and New Year's time, it's it's you're doing typically a lot of underwritings and it's hard to pin down exactly how it's going and how many owners are actually going to actually go to market. Now, uh, we had our big national conference in the beginning of the year and uh, I think we ended up taking about 20 deals out there. And since then, it has basically grown in a steady pace. And I think we are sitting around the first 30 to 35 deals that we're going to close. So we have not seen any slowdown with Treasury going up. We are still seeing that DFW is positioning itself to be more of a tier one market uh, nationally. And uh, so we have seen a lot of uh, people from the coast, from overseas, coming to DFW, new players entering the market. And then, Richard, you're the, the elder statement of, uh, of the table thank here. You there, Mike. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so how is that different? You, you've been in the market a long time. So how is the recent buyer pool different than what you saw 10, 15 years ago? How's our market evolved? It's deeper and it's younger. There's more capital coming into multifamily, into Texas, into Dallas than has ever been. And the access to capital has never been broader through all the different services, either online, through syndicating, just through all of the wealth that's being created in other sectors and other industries. Multifamily is such a good, safe investment harbor in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas in general, is at the the top of everyone's list for investing those, those dollars for sure. And the the volume that you guys have had this year, you, you say you're coming up on 30 deals that you've re- or you're going to close uh, year to date. Where has the pricing um, actually shook out at relative to what the expectation was going into the year? Yeah, expectation of sellers continues to increase, which makes our job fun. But the market and the market participants have stepped up and and hit those expectations. So we're right at our strike prices on average of of all the deals that we're we're on and you know the numbers often you can look at and feel are aggressive and you might have a little um angst going in wondering if you're going to hit those numbers but there continues to be just an abundance of capital and a bunch of investors coming to town and, and we continue to to hit the pricing that are that meets the seller's expectations jacob are we b- building too many apartments we are building a lot of apartments right now and we are seeing some softness in certain pockets. Now, uh, when you hold it up with the uh, employment growth here, uh, there's not, I think, a scare that we are completely overbuilding. But rest assured, if you have three, four assets that are coming online the same quarter within one city block, it's going to be soft. And that's what we're seeing right now with some of the Class A construction. And that's uptown markets in Dallas, Fort Worth. That's Frisco. That's Plano. That's that's the infill markets summer. where all the developers. Uh, that there is a typically a herd mentality with the developers. So if there's one spot they're building, you're seeing multiple developers in the same kind of sub market. 
Can you walk me through what cap rates are right now in the A's, the B's, and the C's? I go, you know, it's sometimes it's sub market to sub market. There may be differences, but can, can I make an overall generalization of where cap rates are in the Dallas Fort Worth market right now? Sure. I would say to start with the Class A, you are looking in the four range for the more of the main and main locations in infield Dallas. Uh, you can sneak up on uh, five plus if you're sitting more on the outskirts of DFW. Now, the interesting thing is value add has and is the preferred type of asset. And for the good value add assets, and here we're talking about B assets in very good location, we are seeing uh, some of the going in caps being in the four still with the expectations of probably reaching around a six year one. That's the 80s, what about the 70s? The 70s, you're probably seeing about 50 to 75 basis points on top of that. It all depends. I think it's important to go in and look at what is actually the capex on it. When you get into 60s and 70s product, sometimes you're you're dealing with capex items that are not necessarily gonna give you more rent. So you, you are seeing a little higher cap rates on, on those, I would say. But overall, what's kind of the general sentiment of the spread between the top of the market, the Class A stuff to the bottom? What kind of how much how much more yield do you get by going lower quality? And then how is that different today than five years ago? I would say that there's probably a plus minus 100. It depends how you look at it. If you look at it when you actually purchase it, I think it's, uh, it's very similar right now for good locations. If you look at your year one, you are still seeing the the B properties and the C properties that you can go in, you can get the 100 to $200 more in rents. And that's why it's so attractive. Now, if you're buying new property, you do not have a way of turning that, that rent up year one. So you might be buying in on the same cap rate, but on the class A's, you should expect to stay more flat. Uh, especially in in the near future, uh, since you're competing with product that's coming out maybe three, four, six months after. So yours. everything going in is pretty much the same. It's all high force. It's close. Yeah. So let's talk about cap rates that I would hope are expanding in the secondary tertiary markets. Let's talk a little bit to Bart Wickard, who kind of handles you know if it if you can jump in the car and drive for an hour or so. Uh, and to buy an apartment building, that's the guy you need to talk to. So, Bart, tell us a little bit about what's going on in the secondary tertiary markets and kind of, again, define what a secondary tertiary market is, in your opinion. Thanks, Paul. So everybody defines secondary tertiary markets differently. To some people, you know, in our corporate office in New York, Dallas is still a secondary market. But for all intents and purposes for here, we say that uh, Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio are primary markets. Secondary markets would be, you know, your cities that are 100,000 plus throughout the state, your Lubbock, Amarillo, Midland, Corpus Christi, those types of markets. And then your tertiary markets that are less than than 100,000 people. But um, to your question earlier about cap rates and, and expansion, you know, we're, we're still not seeing expanding cap rates, even as interest rates do tick up on us, even in the secondary markets. In the past, you would look at about a hundred basis point spread between primary market cap rates and secondary markets. But to our conversation earlier, what we're seeing right now, because the primary markets are still so competitive, for those who are looking for scale and even those looking for their first deal, they're having to venture outside the major metroplexes to to do that. And so with that has become you know, increasing competition levels, which ultimately will compress cap rates. So, you know, historically where you've seen maybe a hundred basis point spread, that's probably closer to 50 basis points, depending on the market um, and depending on the the asset class. But we here in this office are, are seeing transaction levels in the secondary and tertiary markets that, that are at, you know, record levels and, and they're doesn't seem to be an indication that that's slowing down anytime soon, which is great for both buyers and sellers, right? The sellers who have traditionally been longer term holders in these secondary markets are, are finally transacting. But then you're also seeing a, a lot of new buyers to these markets that see the merits of 
the actual market fundamentals and then the increased cap rates and then you know finally the opportunity to to actually buy deals and not compete with say 30 offers but 10 to 15. So yeah, so maybe maybe talk through what what does a typical transaction look for you from like a buyer pool tours and how does that compare to say a market like Dallas or Houston or you know any, any one of the more major metropolitan areas across the country? Yeah, Mike, it it really depends, I guess, on the market and the asset, be it A, B, or C, and deal size. It's a lot harder to get a new buyer to go to, let's say, Lubbock, Texas, for a fifty unit property than it is to sell a fifty unit property in Dallas, where you know, you own a couple deals down the street. And so that buyer pool for a 50 unit asset in Lubbock is going to be relatively small. But I guess if you were just to try to generalize the the levels, you know, on a Plano two property portfolio, B class value add, that's probably where we're going to see our most activity in Dallas. We have what, 60 tours and 40 offers for a secondary market. It's going to be closer to 20 tours, 20 offers on the high end. But I think more often you see about 10 to 15 offers and it comes from all levels. You know, your institutional buyers and your REITs aren't going to secondary markets, but your private equity, your syndicators, your high net worth, family offices are all competing for those deals. And then, hey, how's your buyer pool modified or changed over the last, this this cycle really? So what what are you seeing today relative to, you know, four or five years ago as far as the types of buyers that are coming in and the depth of the market? You're definitely seeing more of them. I don't know that the type has necessarily changed that much. You're seeing more of them. But I, I think too, you're also seeing more of your first time buyers and your syndicator type groups who see an opportunity to buy in some of these secondary tertiary markets where they can kind of cut their teeth, if you will, if you will, get their their feet wet, um, so they can then take that experience and then bring it back to primary markets, having done a couple deals. Can you walk around a little bit here in Texas about some markets that you like? Another question is uh, hard money. Is that uh, one of the things that the secondary markets are almost are they requiring that? Because Dallas, they definitely require hard money from day one. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's one of the benefits of the secondary markets is maybe those expectations aren't quite there yet so that you can still do a traditional 30-30 on a secondary market deal. It's not unheard of to get hard money, especially on competitive deals, but the assumption that you have to have hard money going in really is not there, um, which I think can be very beneficial for buyers, especially if they haven't been through the process as often as maybe a Michael Becker. Now, again, I know you like all the secondary tertiary markets. Tell me ones that you like a little bit better than the rest. So, I mean, that that's a difficult question to answer only because, I, like you said, I like them all and, and they all have their own merits. Rather than tell you the markets I like, I think where people need to be cautious is markets where there's only one economic driver or, you know, for the state of Texas where military is the primary driver. It's not that those are bad markets. It's just I think you have to recognize maybe that there could be a little additional risk there. And and lenders will react accordingly to that additional risk with lower LTVs. But for the most part, most of the secondary tertiary cities throughout Texas, you know, they're growing just as fast as the primary markets just on a smaller scale. So and you don't have that supply pipeline concern, which is which is really nice. Talk a little bit about Midland Odessa because you know, three four years ago we had oil up at one hundred eleven dollars a barrel in West Texas, and then all of a sudden it collapsed down to say thirty two. Now, as we record this podcast, it's around seventy. Uh, is that started to turn the lights on back in Midland Odessa for multifamily? I think Paul, it's probably one of the better kept secrets of, of any multifamily market in the country. What's going on in, in the Permian Basin and out in West Texas is quite remarkable. The great thing that's going on out there right now is your blue chip oil and gas companies, your ExxonMobil, your Chevron, your Anadarkos, your Pioneers. These are the big blue chip companies are investing billions and billions and billions of dollars into infrastructure, into land, into pipelines, into personnel. That kind of capital commitment is very significant. It's translating to a lot of jobs, a lot of high paying jobs. And 
because there had been a lull in oil prices, you had nothing built for four years. So there's pent up demand for apartments. Midland and Odessa had the highest rent growth in both 2016 and 2017 in the entire country. We're talking about about 30% rent growth a year, yeah. and there's no sign of, of slowing down. So you are seeing some transactions occur out there today, and you know I expect to, to see more in the near future. How about walking around to Lubbock and Amarillo? Again, two very strong secondary markets that do benefit a little bit from oil and gas, but you have Texas Tech that's adding 6% uh, more students per year to their student population. That's already at 40,000 students. They all need a place to stay, and then the, they need teachers, and they need, you know, all the way down to the janitors at the school. And that's one economic driver there. But low unemployment, I think Amarillo and Lubbock, next to Midland and Odessa, sh- share the lowest unemployment in the state. Very new, little supply. So, you know, market fundamentals for apartments are, are very good. Let's walk on the other side of Texas over to East Texas. How about uh, Longview, Tyler, and places south? Longview and Tyler are, you know, because of their proximity to DFW, rather than a Southwest Airline flight to Amarillo, you can drive there, which is very appealing to a lot of people. They did experience a little bit of a decline um, with the pullback in oil and gas because of the Haynesville shale out there and some oil and gas plays, not to the extent that Midland and Odessa did. But we're definitely seeing some good things happen in in East Texas. And again, proximity to Dallas is very appealing to both owners and buyers alike. Let's walk up uh, 35, go from Waco, headed up north here, from Waco to Temple. What do you think about those markets? Well, anything along the I-35 corridor in Texas is, is very appealing. We're seeing from industrial to distribution to Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio all being on I-35. The growth along that corridor is, is quite remarkable, and there are a lot of good things happening. It's good. Well, that's a, that's a pretty good overview of the secondary tertiary markets. So maybe talk about a little bit, just kind of just macro, kind of open it up to, to any of you guys, really just kind of what's... What's it taking today to win deals in the marketplace? What's some advice to potential uh, buyers out in the marketplace when they're bidding on these deals, especially on, on these market deals? What is it going to take to, to win a marketed deal today? Well, typically, it is going to be competitive. So putting your best foot forward in, in all areas um, is likely what it's going to take to to be the guy that the, the buyer wants to enter to a purchase sell agreement, that being showing that you have your capital stack in place, your equity source is there, you've underwritten the debt, you've sized it appropriately. So it gives them the confidence that if you go under contract, you have the capital there to, to get it closed. Being as aggressive and assertive as you can be on your terms, your dates, your time to, to complete your due diligence, your time to close, and then non-refundable, hard money, uh, non-refundable earnest money up front. The more that confidence that you have to allow more money to be released sooner than later, the more confidence you're going to show to that seller that you're, you're the group that they need to go into contract with. Jacob, maybe let's talk about a deal story here. I know, I know you guys recently uh, or had the Bay Island Apartments out in Garland on the marketplace. Maybe that I think that was a pretty competitive process. That was a, a deal I'm pretty familiar with, and so it used to be the property, uh, the first property I ever bought, and we sold it to my buddy, uh, who's now going to market with it a couple years after he bought it from me. So maybe kind of talk through that deal, kind of the deal story, uh, maybe just overview of that property and that transaction, and kind of how the process went. Sure. So Bay Island, we're looking at a 120 unit apartment complex that sits out close to uh, one of the major lakes in DFW, Ray Hubbard. It basically sits in walking distance down to the to the lake and close proximity to uh, some of the major highway networks. So overall, a very clean and also well-located asset. Now, that type of asset with that unit count, it works for a lot of people. It's, um, it's large enough so you can pair up with a third-party professional management company. And it is still such a bite size that a lot of private funds, they can uh, compete on it. So when we're looking at uh, an asset like that, 
typically we we will have and i think our tours it would be right around 35 to 40 tours on it ultimately that yields about that 20 to 25 offers on it the ones i saw actually being successful in kind of getting to the next level and into a best and final scenario it was all groups that really had done their due diligence up front they already knew who their lender would be. They knew what loan to value they, they could get. They were realistic about it. They were ready for hard money. There were no groups picked for the best and final without hard money. So overall, the most streamlined groups got picked to 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 have that discussion. And uh, um, there was ultimately one buyer that got the deal awarded and uh, he is um, ready to go here in short order. Is there any sort of takeaways you can maybe give to someone who's aspiring to do this that that the do's and the don'ts that uh, is kind of you know any sort of mistakes you saw some people make that maybe maybe you want to um, point out where the next the next bar can maybe come come in and learn from that? Sure. Again, I think it's very very important to have your team built. You will be asked by us uh, who who the players are, um, and that goes with your debt. That goes with your management company. Again, it was uh, a very close race. So it's not a scenario where you want to come up and say, well, I'm looking at maybe five, six lenders and I will, I'll see what happens here. We need to understand who you're going to work with on the, on the management uh, side so, so we know that your, your budget is correct. Again, it's being well prepared and have your team ready. So we get that. Uh, and we appreciate the uh, the insight uh, that you've shared on that one, but share you know a lot of people don't understand how difficult your job is. They they really don't. They they think that um, that brokers just uh, show properties, but what they don't see is what's behind the curtain type of stuff. And uh, you know, share with me a little bit about what you guys do like on a typical day, because people see the that inventory is tight that uh, there's not a lot of product that's available to buy, but you guys are actually making the calls to the people that are trying to sell the property. That's a hugely competitive business. How come you guys do so damn well in this marketplace? Is it, you guys just have the deeper relationships? Is it the broader spectrum that you guys, more, more services that you guys have, the better the marketing? So tell us a little bit about a typical day in the life of Jacob Anderson. Sure. And, and Paul, unfortunately, I can't give the, all the secret sauce up. But <laughs> one thing I think that's important and, and uh, uh, for us sitting at this table here, we work all as a team. So the internal uh, backup we get from each other on any given deal gives us, um, I think, superior firepower when it comes to show deals and work the deals in general. I would say that the other thing that to keep in mind is one thing is to show a deal, but our goal is never to get the, the high LOI in. Ultimately, that's just a number on a piece of paper. Our goal is always to get to closing and get to closing the fastest and easiest way possible. So if you front load a deal with a lot of these questions and they might not always be conducive to you know popping up a a deal in the best possible way but be realistic about it and making sure everyone is on the same pace here so it will close that's probably the one thing that we're working very very hard on every day so richard what are you seeing right now somebody owns a transaction owns an apartment building they've owned it for five or six or seven years are they going out, if they sell a deal through through ARA, are they going out and rebuying another multifamily property or are they getting out of the market? What are they, what are they doing with the proceeds? That's always one of the, the major uh, questions someone has to answer before they actually decide to sell the property. If it actually closes, what do we do? Where do we go from there? I would say in workforce housing, there's a large percentage, maybe as, as high as half, who actually... Um, roll the property into an exchange and they simply just roll the property into another like kind property uh, typically here in, in Dallas as well. Are they staying in multifamily? Are they taking out to single tenant office warehouse? Or are they just 
you know, distributing the funds back to the investors? What, what's, uh, what's typically what you're seeing? Most people are either distributing the funds back to the investors. And when you have multiple investors over a long period of time, people's lives change, people's investment criteria change, people's needs change. So often the funds just get re- distributed back. But if they're not, they're typically rolled back into multifamily because most likely, and everyone that's invested over the last five years has, have done well, um, it's still a, a very liquid, relatively speaking, product. And people know it better than they know the other retail, office, industrial options. So typically, yes. So Jacob, you do a lot of tours at these properties and you see a lot of how these properties perform. But what are you seeing for amenities? Are you seeing any updated amenities on these properties, on the C going to the B space? I know we're updating the properties, but what are, you know, Mike's big thing was back two years ago was these package lockers. What's the new amenity? What's the hot thing that people have to have if they're updating their properties? Sure. I would say that we have seen the various versions, and this is just on the interiors. We have seen the evolution of, of kind of various versions on the interior, and, and we continue to see that um, being fine-tuned, and, and we're seeing added products inside. And that can be on uh, just the finish outs, but also technology. We see more people coming in with catering to iPhones and whatnot in the units. Now on the amenity package, I think the ones we have seen that really pop is for pets, especially, and and kids. And um, mainly pets, that has been a big income generator on other income. And we continue to see assets catering to 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 our pets richard anything more on uh, what are you seeing in the class a and b what are just the unbelievable amenities packages that you see in the class a and b's right now jacob hit the last one uh the pets people really love their animals <laughs> that's a big one having uh, stalls to um, charge your electrical car your electric car now mm-hmm. that's starting to pick up in uh in core new development especially with garage parking another angle a couple deals that we're we're marketing class a deals it's not necessarily an amenity but the owners are uh, utilizing solar uh, electrical panels on the roofs to provide electricity for common areas and for things that they can build up front build into the cost of the property and then the benefit of you know, the usage or less usage going forward is passed along then to the to the new buyer. Sounds good. And now, Bart, tell us a little bit, uh, you know, you don't have to tell us all the secrets, but on the last transaction you closed, let's say it was six months ago or five months ago, how did that person in the secondary tertiary market win that deal? Was it the highest price? Again, think of just one one transaction that you had. Was it very, was it close to whatever the, what you had told the seller what the strike price was? Was it the quality and confidence of the buying group? Uh, was it a large percentage of the money that came, was down on the deal? Was it hard money? Think think about one transaction that, that uh, you know, you don't have to say any names, but just kind of walk us through what, what won that deal. Yeah, so invariably different sellers are going to have different hot buttons, whether it be price or hard money or hey, I've, I've worked with that lender before. I know that that broker and I trust that they're shooting this buyer straight, whatever it might be. You know, it, it's it's different on different deals. But like Jacob said before, I think the, the biggest way to win uh, a deal is to have your ducks in a row, have your team very well put together. And that just exudes confidence for the owner to say, this is the group I, I want to work with. Being an open book to your broker and telling them both positive and negative about you, even if you perceive it as negative, that goes a long way with us to where we're able to translate to that that owner and say, hey, these are all the good things about them. This is the one thing that they, in fact, pointed out about them that they might not have prepared yet. But I think if anything... Um, knowing that and being able to to communicate to that owner um, is going to give a, a confidence level. So I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but you know the criteria is going to be the same for secondary markets, and it's just giving owners comfort. Great. Well, 
Richard, Bart, Jacob, we definitely appreciate you guys coming in. Uh, if people want to reach out to you guys and, and maybe get to know you, get to get put on uh, the future deal list, what's the uh, best way to reach out to you guys? You can always go to aranewmark.com. That's where our listings and contact information are, are located, um, and our emails are, are there. So our website's probably the best way to, to stay in touch with us. And again, uh, you guys are going to be at the Old Capital Conference, and so people can actually uh, come up and say hello, shake your hand, and get uh, some ideas of what you guys have for opportunities and inventory out there. So we appreciate you being part of part of that uh, uh, group September 13th at the at Cowboy Stadium. So, uh, guys, thanks for coming in. Appreciate that. Michael Becker, always good to see you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.